Thanks so much, Goldie. Thank you so much to everyone who's here. Really appreciative of um, everyone taking their time out of their busy schedules to come. And how awesome has this summit been today? Yeah! Just awesome, awesome, awesome. I have so much, so much from what industry is doing as well as some of the um, agencies and all the good things that we're talking about today. A um, lot of thought-provoking happening, so I'm going to just kick it off and try to pull all of that together and cohese it with all of the CIA and the confidentiality, integrity, the availability, but I'm also going to give you a spin of the enemy gets a vote. So we're going to talk about how those architectures have to consider the enemy, the adversary, and how that TTP, that tool, technique, and procedure that they are learning as we distribute our frameworks, as we publicize our policies, as we create legislation, someone else is paying attention besides us. And sometimes they are not often in good form. So with that, I'm gonna to go to this next slide here. And we're gonna talk about operations in cyberspace. So I get a lot of questions on, you know, Marine Corps, how are they doing cyber? Marine Corps is known for lethality, um, it's, it's um, infantry focus, it's support to the Naval Tactical Grid, it's um, Fleet Marine Force. So I've actually seen a few tweets, I've seen a few LinkedIn messages saying Marine Corps doesn't do cyber. So, you know, how, what, are you, what are you talking about? And so I wanted to take a little bit of time to talk about what does it mean to have operations in cyberspace. So you have your blue space, and you have what the gray space is, and you have this red space. And so red space is where the adversary is. And any time that the adversary wants to come into your blue space, that's why you have to create these architectures for resiliency. MARFOR Cyber has a responsibility for the Marine Corps Enterprise Network. It's part of the DODEN. We heard from um, DISA earlier today, and he talks a little bit about the DODEN. So the DODEN is the Department of Defense Information Network. It's a composite of all of the services um, to include um, the combatant commands. Initially, way back when, when we discovered these um, legacy networks and legacy systems, we were always focused on network, focused on threat agnostic, and oftentimes we were very reactive. And in some cases today, we are still very reactive, meaning a breach occurs, we get an alert, and then we do incident response, correct? So how can we take a proactive approach and focus on while we discover the past incidents and how we handled a particular issue, looking at user credentials, looking at um, the ability to move laterally against your network and those different configuration policies and procedures, how do we evolve? So today, Marine Corps has this Marine Corps Cyberspace Operations Group. We also serve as the cybersecurity service provider. What does that mean? So we have these network battalions for our command and control that we've been creating, and we work with the regions as well as DISA and Headquarters Marine Corps. Just to familiarize you a little bit and orient you on our information environment, the Marine Corps has a Deputy Commandant of Information. Her name is Lieutenant General Reynolds. She is focused on the entire enterprise, so not just what provides a service, but also the tactical, because at the tactical edge, another buzzword, we have Marines who need access to data, we have commanders who need to make decisions, and most importantly, as, our, as my colleague from the USDA talked about earlier with her Marine Corps experience, there's some life-changing decisions that occurs in an instant. So while we are penetrating the lives of others in some cases, unfortunately, we are also in positions where we have to protect and save the lives of many people. With that, why zero trust? I'm glad you asked. Okay, go back. Okay, so there's an architecture document that um, should be up there. The um, architecture that we have put in place is more based on capabilities for our Marines. Thank you so much. So what you see up in front of you is our current initiatives on Zero Trust. Those initiatives cause you to focus on authentication, as we heard about today. We have access controls that's based on identity, rules, 
and roles and responsibilities. And then there's this piece of protecting the data and its usage. So as we look at that full architecture based on capabilities, how do we instantiate zero trust from an industry's perspective? I was talking to one of my uh, team members today and he said something very thought provoking. And as, you, as we share our time here today, it's very interesting how when you hear zero trust, I assume and, and agree with him that we think of many different definitions. We think of many different architectures, we think of many different capabilities. So that's why we, we look to policies and procedures and core baselines to create that um, synchronization that's needed. But as that synchronization is created and those baselines are you know, pushed out, how do we deal with our adversary today? And then how do we think about the pivots that are required as we innovate and create? Because now the enemy is also within your architecture and has been able to either create vulnerabilities or explore vulnerabilities, or in some cases, kind of move within your network undetected. Those are called breaches, and I'll leave the list of um, breaches for us earlier today that we talked about many of them. Um, the biggest one you can think about is OPM, largest breach um, in the federal government, one of the largest um, infiltrations of data. And so the Marine Corps thinks about all of the, that information and all of the experiences and the lessons learned. And what we try to do is we look at how do we achieve the challenges of trust, trust again, verify, access, trust again. Um, and in order to do that, there's a level of authentication. So we all heard today about identity and access management. So identity is the largest piece, in my opinion, of the zero trust model. If your identity is flawed, then your authentication tool will fail. Another initiative that we have happening with the DLD CIO is Comply to Connect. And so the compliance piece is based on policy, but if you have that orchestration occurring and you have the machine learning occurring and the orchestration is errored or the orchestration is dated or the orchestration doesn't work, how do you address your uptake and tickets at your help desk? Because I can't access, I can't use, I can't create, I can't compute, etc. So, So what do you do? You have to go back to the basics. Um, you're gonna hear a lot of what I'm saying is a repeat of a lot of what my counterparts talk today. Because if we don't get back to the basics and do the basics correctly or do the basics effectively, then no amount of architecture will master the threat that is facing us consistently every day. We like to call it a pacing threat. And the reason we call it a pacing threat is because the enemy never slows down. The adversary is always either scanning your networks or they are always um, viewing your data, whether that's Facebook, whether that's LinkedIn, whether that's Twitter, whether that's any of the platforms that is providing information. And the ability to aggregate that information is why the zero trust model is so important. Now, as we, as we take a look at everything that we're doing from artificial intelligence to the ability to have cloud, um, legacy systems, smart buildings. Yes, the Marine Corps has a smart building. Um, and so as we look at protecting that 100% evolved threat landscape, how do you manage the identities? How do we look at that identity and do role-based access from a system administration perspective? All those are great questions to ask, but also, we have to consider the how. And zero trust modeling and the architectures that we have to consider, the how is one of the most important pieces. Why? The how is a way you create and understand that person's normal behavior. So we think a lot about the inside of threat as part of the National Security Agency. That is one thing that is an area of focus. However, when a person's behavior change, we talked, we heard earlier, what if it's something that occurred in that person's life that makes that person's behavior change on the system? Maybe, you know, they needed to take some training that had otherwise not been identified. So how do we have an architecture that allows you to adjust to the shift that could occur within your users? Whether that user is in a degraded environment and now they are deployed, 
um, for users within the Department of Defense, we are often in austere locations. We are often in areas where access to data is truly critical, but we may not have the same connection. So in a zero trust architecture, you have to be able to pivot and inject different kinds of models. Those models are important to us because, again, the enemy gets the vote. Once, you know, the enemy says, okay, well, this is what Marine Corps is doing. Here's what Army is doing. Here's what Navy is doing. And now we are, we have a such, we have evolved the threat so much to where they are also targeting industry. Things like Target, areas where our point of sale systems are being infiltrated. Well, because the aggregate of data gets to the identity. So if I know where this person shops and they just so happen to work for the Department of Defense and the Air Force, and that person is a commander who's gonna make decisions, maybe I can impersonate that person. So I'll go through their different logins or publicly available data and infiltrate their, their cell phone. Why? Because their cell phone has the ability to be mobile. That mobile phone allows you to create and exploit identities and Oh, one day he's gonna charge that phone. He's gonna plug it into one of those systems. Why? At work. Because the need for information is so instant, instant that quite possibly there may not be a policy in place where they detect when someone has um, plugged that mobile phone in. And now I have the ability to gain access to a government system because I use my government laptop to, to um, charge my phone. Why is all that important? Well, because if you don't have the discipline of your people and we don't have the architecture in place, we don't have the policies, we don't have the strategies and, and, and the different um, requirements, then we have the largest challenge, implementation of zero trust. The architecture, again, is one thing that I feel like is minimal if we do not concentrate on making the architecture be efficient Yes, cost effective, but also cost avoiding. With that, as the Marine Corps looks at the way we can implement zero trust, we look to industry for a lot of the problem solved and lessons learned. The Department of Defense CIO is very interested in understanding endpoint security and understanding what the best solution is for the Department of Defense information network. With that, our experiences, orchestrations, pathfinders, pilots. I know a lot of um, people approach me about what is the Marine Corps doing. We do have a Comply to Connect pathfinder that we are looking forward to executing and learning about all of the different things that occur as we assess the ability to comply, assess the ability to, if you are not in compliant, remediate. And there's this isolation piece that, you know, we really don't like, but sometimes that is what the best approach is. So as we all think about the enemy gets to vote, as we all think about what type of architecture should we be putting in place for zero trust, I urge you to take a look at all the different working groups that are happening as we look at NIST standards and the FIPS standards and all of the different pieces of legislation that occur from a privacy perspective as well as the impact to a person's civil liberties. I urge you to collaborate and, and have a transparency of information so that we all can understand what their baseline is and allow us those different opportunities to innovate. And the biggest piece I wanna leave you with today is after we solve that problem today, we probably need to be thinking about what does it look like five years from now? What does it look like 10 years from now as quantum computing comes online, as we have 5G already here today, the next horizon and the next ridge line is something that the Marine Corps is being forward thinking about and we're looking forward to all of our partners joining us with that. Again, on behalf of Major General Glavy and the Commandant of the Marine Corps, as well as the Deputy Commandant of Information in the Marine Corps, I appreciate you for having me on for Cyber and most of all, I appreciate this summit. Thank you very much.